grace in Christianity is one of those things that everybody wants, but nobody wants to give. Everybody wants to get, but nobody wants to donate, so to speak. Grace is the challenge that most Christians face whenever they deal with this whole idea of cheap grace, convenient grace, oh, I don't know. There's lots of different terms and words that they use for it, but basically what it boils down to, to put it in a simple term, is that people want to have rules, really. They want to have regulations. They want to find, as it were, some kind of measuring rod or measuring stick with which they can measure up to and achieve on their own some form of righteousness. And that's the Christian way. Christians want to be making themselves perfect as opposed to being concluded or thought of as being good enough when they really want to make themselves better. The whole idea in America is, after all, the hero. Isn't there that kind of desire to be the hero? To be the one who makes the last basket shot? Woo! Game winning buzzer! Way we won! Because of me. Or the person who dies on the grenade and dies for their country. Oh, God bless all those that have given their lives. For the sake of what? Their country? Well, that seems like a dumb reason to die. You see, there's always somehow, some way, some means with which man wants to make himself righteous, make himself perfect. He wants to be in charge. So grace is completely contrary and very much so an aggravation to the Christian at large because it doesn't allow you to do what you want to do, which is control your own destiny. You want to be in charge, just like I do. But grace is something different than that. You see, grace makes us humble because we can't do anything about it. We can't make ourselves get grace, so that takes us out of the equation. We can't force grace upon ourselves because that means that we would be doing it and we can't do that. You see, grace is something that's extended by God. Grace is something that's given by God. Grace is something that God did that we can't do. And that's why the study of grace is so important because most people don't appreciate grace because they don't know what it is. What do you mean it's something that I could not do for myself but that which God has done for me? What do you mean it's a free gift? Anytime we use some of these cliche definitions, we wind up with the problems that go along with people trying to identify something that they won't put the rest of criteria on. You see, grace is a part of the nature of God. God is love, and part of that love is not only meekness, kindness, gentleness, mercy, loving kindness, you know the rest. 1 Corinthians 13. Can't be provoked and all those other things. But part of love is the extending of grace. It's the giving of grace. It's giving something to someone even though they deserve something else. Grace is being beneficent or benevolent. Two big B words that I'm sure if you look them up in the dictionary you can understand what they mean, but beneficence is when you have a greater power and authority than the other person and you're willing to let that power come down some in order to allow that other person to come close. You're beneficent to the other person. Benevolent means that you're good. You're giving something to someone that you're willing to give them something that they can't get for themselves or you, they could have, but you're going to give of what you have to them. So beneficence and benevolence is part of that nature of grace and part of what God is, which is love. Studying of grace is so important that we made it a topic of video grace so that we would look at examine and talk about those aspects that Christians really don't know. Because we'll take it, but we'll run with it. We'll take it and we'll abuse it. We'll take it and confuse it, but will we give grace for grace? Would we extend mercy for mercy? Will we be forgiving as we have been forgiven? Because once you've received grace, God wants you to give grace. So be careful. There's a little bit of a hook there. 
you may be getting yourself into something that you haven't realized quite how God operates when he said you reap what you sow. You need to understand grace so that you would be given grace in time of need as well as in your own life so that you can be saved. Because without grace, you aren't saved at all. So using the book that Chuck Smith wrote, Why Grace Changes Everything, we've been going through it and talking about each section. Just kind of like you know, identifying little key portions and inspiring us to maybe comment on it and say, did you get that? Did you understand what he's saying here? Did you hear that? Did the Spirit of God make it real to you, or do we need to kind of like flesh it out? So, in this section, a dead end righteousness, one very common way of trying to become righteous is to define what righteousness is and what it isn't. To set up a code and then live according to that code. There's only one problem. No one ever lives up to their own code. So we conjure up a great number of excuses to explain why we fail. The most common is that our failure isn't really our fault. If I drop a glass and break it, it isn't that I am uncoordinated. It's because someone called me when he shouldn't have. Others were making too much noise in the other room, so my mistake is really their fault. Look at what you caused me to do, I say. You made me do it, so it isn't my fault. None of us like to accept blame. We don't take responsibility for our own actions. This attitude goes all the way back to Adam. He blamed his failure on Eve. The woman that you gave me to be my wife, he told God, it's her fault that I am the way I am. See Genesis 3.12. Proverbs declares, there is a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. Proverbs 30.12. The generation we live in today is that generation. There is a rationalization of all of life going on right now that can explain, coordinate, and blame someone else for everything that you do and never cause you to look at yourself and say, I did it, the buck stops here, I am responsible. That's the generation that's righteous in their own eyes. But you see, even that's not enough because what they've done too is that they've said, God's not really that mad at you. God is so loving that he's going to forgive you, so we don't need to set a standard of righteousness that we need to meet. We need to understand that we don't have to meet that standard. So you see how grace has been kind of changed where people try to make it, you don't try to get where you want to go, you just try to accept what God took care of for you. Very tricky subject right there. We accept what God took care of for us. So we'll go out and sin anyways because after all, we can't stop ourselves from sinning. We can't prevent ourselves from sinning. We can't be better than we are, but we can't accept what God has done for us. So we'll accept his forgiveness. We'll take his grace and we'll run with it. We'll act like we're forgiven, but we'll go ahead and insist that someone else has to live up to a standard. Isn't that really what happens nine times out of ten when you talk to people, when they say that they have a standard or they don't have a standard, they'll say, oh, I got no standard. Really? Good. <coughs> can I steal from you? You've got no standard, so I can go ahead and steal from you and you won't mind. Well, my, but that's different. Well, no, it's not. you got no standard of righteousness. you got no standard of doing right or wrong. If your standard is gone, then I can do whatever I want. And so can you. And I can hurt you. Because, you see, that's a standard of behavior. That's a standard of righteousness. The standard that you act and you live and you become is what's called a standard of righteousness. Righteousness simply means doing the right thing. Choosing to do something that's right. So how do you know what's right or wrong? Based upon morals and mores of what we have determined that God has said to us. For the Christian, that basis of morals and moral standard is the moral law. The moral law was recorded by God. He said, be perfect, be loving, be forgiving, be obedient. And we did none of them. So because we did none of them, he said, look, this is what's going to happen if you don't pay attention to my laws. If you do this, an eye you take, an eye will be taken from you. 
If you do this, this is what happens. If you cause the death of a cow, a cow's price would be paid or you'll be taken a cow from. In other words, God was trying to show people, look, this is common sense. This is God sense. This is moral law. This is what you need to understand. Now, if you want to approach me, if you want to come up to my level, not just reaping what you sow on earth, if you want to understand who I am, then you have to meet my law. So let me give you my law. My law is, first of all, personified in one person that I can show you is perfect, Jesus. So let me, let me explain it to you. Be like Jesus and you can come and meet me. You know, be like Jesus and you can come talk to me. But if you can't measure up to that standard, then you can't be with me. But I'll make a way where you can approach me. And if you follow that way, then I will listen and I will do and I will forgive you of your standards. And if you'll take my standards, then I'll accept you. Because my standard is going to be simple. I'll love you. I'll forgive you. I'll have mercy upon you and I'll give you grace. And all you have to do is love your enemy, treat your enemy with mercy, treat your enemy with forgiveness, and treat your enemy with grace. Oh yeah, and all the other people too. Well, that don't seem fair, God. Really? I created them, and I created you. So you see, God has a standard that he wants us to measure up to. Fortunately, or for some people, unfortunately, they can't measure up to it. So what happens is that their standard of behavior suddenly comes crashing into a complex issue. God. What does God require of me? What does God want of me? How can I measure up to God's standard? Because we've already identified today that most men and women have a standard of some kind of behavior, but they don't live up to their own standard. Just like you can say to me that, well, you know, I don't like when people gossip about me. So do you gossip? Of course you do. Well, I don't like it when people steal. You know, stealing is wrong. We should put that in our standard of living. Really? Do you steal? Sure you do. You stole from the government probably, on IRS taxes someplace, or you've done it some other way. But you've stolen. Be real. You stole it when you were a little kid. Well, yeah, but you know. Always an excuse and always a reason, but you can't measure up to the standard. The only thing that we want to know by that is that can you measure up to what you say you believe in? And the truth is, we can't. That's what grace is about. We cannot measure up to what we say we believe. We can't measure up to what we think we believe. We can't measure up to anything we say we do. <coughs> As a matter of fact, when it comes to God being able to see everything we say, everything we do, everything in our heart, everything that we live by, we don't measure up to ourselves. We are the biggest hypocrites there are. And the reality is, God already knew that. So that's why we study grace. That's why we apply grace. That's why God wants us to learn of grace and to not give out standards of righteousness for other people because we can't even live up to our own standard of righteousness. So you can't throw down the gauntlet to someone else and say, hey, I want you to do this when you can't do it. You don't tell someone else, I want you to be this when you can't be it. So you can't fix yourself, you can't be yourself, and you can't set up the standard, so how are you going to live? How are you going to exist when your standard of righteousness you are going to fail at? And God's righteousness, we already know we fail at because he requires perfection. It's by grace. Funny how that works, isn't it? By grace are you saved, and that not of yourself, lest any man should boast. But it is a gift of God, lest any man should take credit for it, because God gives it as he chooses. So it's by grace you are saved. And because you are saved by grace, the biggest thing you're going to learn out of this entire study is grace for grace, mercy for mercy, love for love, forgiveness for forgiveness. If you learn that to love so that you'll be loved, to forgive so you'll be forgiven, give mercy so you receive mercy, to give grace so you receive grace, You'll have learned everything that is in this book. <laughs> but I think you might want to listen and maybe watch. Because you'd be surprised how easy it is that we take grace for granted.
forget how to give grace to those that are in need.